All right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> My name is Chris Dissinger. I'm one of the organizers of Pecha Kucha Night. And we are so excited to be here this evening, part of Highlight. This is our first time as part of Highlight. So uh, we're, we're learning our, our ropes a little bit as we go here. Um, but uh, we're excited to be here, and uh, we've got a great lineup this evening, an inspiring lineup. I want to ask everybody here, who who's here for the first time to a Pecha Kucha night? Raise your hands. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of you. Okay. So we're going to give you a little 90-second video that gives you a little taste of what Pecha Kucha is about. Right, so Pecha Kucha. So in the past, we've spelt, we've we've we played a, a pretty scientific little video that details the pronunciation of this word. And as far as I know, we haven't had any challengers to it. So just to clarify, it's not Pachacacha, it's not Pikachu, <laughs> or any number of the other iterations. It's Pecha Kucha. Everybody. <laughs> nice. All right. Very good. Um, so, in, oh, very good. So, um, it, as you, as you might have noticed in the video, um, that was taken mostly in Tokyo, and Pecha Kucha Night started in Tokyo, um, and it was started by a group of architects who basically got tired of architects droning on and on and on and on about their work, and so they decided to create this format, and I'll talk about the format in a little bit, but basically what it means is chit-chat in Japanese. <laughs> okay, so what is Pecha Kucha Night? Well, it's six, 40, six minutes and 40 seconds presentation. So it's 20 slides. Each slide appears on the screen for exactly 20 seconds. So this is all automated. So when the presenter gets up here and begins their presentation, the slides move automatically. Every 20 seconds, new slide, 20 slides total. That's why you see us wearing, it's not a Bible verse, six minutes, 40 seconds. Okay, so um, what is Pecha Kucha? What is it really, what does it distill down to? It really distills down to a diversity of passion. It's really about passion, and what you see here, what you will see tonight, are your neighbors, your fellow Vermonters getting up and sharing their passion. And so we feel like that's really very important, and that's why we volunteer to do this. So it's about passion, and why do we volunteer? Well, we volunteer because we believe that in this time of so much divisive rhetoric, that it's nice for us to get together and share our passions, to come together and share what we really believe in and what inspires us in a welcoming forum. Uh, and it's this kind of event that we feel can lead to meaningful understanding and change. So we really feel like Pecha Kucha Night is just about building community through a diversity of passion. So 
So real quick, Pecha Kucha Night cannot happen without our supporters. This is not something that we make money off of. This is not something that we're all volunteers. We um, have sponsors. Uh, our lead sponsor, and we really want to recognize them this evening, is Mascoma Bank. They've been behind us all year. This is our third event here at Flynn Space. And what I would like to do is welcome up Pete Jones, who's the Northern Vermont market leader and commercial lender for Mascoma Bank, who wants to give a brief message. Pete. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mascoma Bank is very pleased to, to uh, be a primary supporter of Pecha Kucha, not just uh, tonight's event, but all, uh, all year, uh, which includes the, the two previous ones that, that have uh, been held here in the space. We're really gratified that our support has uh, allowed Pecha Kucha to, um, uh, to, uh, to be in this space, as opposed to you know, be shopping around or, or, or hunting around for, uh, for some space. Mascoma Bank, uh, relatively new uh, face in the market. We're a B Corporation, the only bank in the market that is a, a B Corp, which means uh, that we uh, care deeply about our community, about our employees, uh, about the environment. Uh, and we are, uh, as I mentioned, just really uh, gratified and in the spirit of Pecha Kucha, which is get it over with quick, that's my definition of what Pecha Kucha means. Uh, I'll, end, I'll end it there, but just invite you to, uh, to uh, visit us at any of our uh, uh, new branches on either Pine Street in the Maltex building out on Shelburne Road and, uh, and meet some of our crew, wh who on behalf of uh, our group here in Burlington, which is about uh, 20 people now, uh, we'd like to wish you a very uh, merry, happy new year and, uh, and uh, much prosperity uh, in, the, in the new year, too. Uh, and um, Denise uh, and I are here, my wife, she's gonna take a picture of me because I'm gonna tell all my friends I've got a stand-up routine going, uh, New Year's <laughs> Eve. <laughs> Thank you, happy new year. And, and as Pete mentioned, uh, this is our third event here in our new home, and really Mascoma made that possible for us to be here in Flynn Space. And um, just so you know, this is volume 30. This is our 30th Pecha Kucha night here in Burlington. So it's kind of a milestone for us. Uh, we've been doing it for eight years. Uh, there have been over, um, let's see, uh, uh, almost 300 unique presentations. So that's really something to be proud of. Um, so, uh, but we, we, we used to be at the Fleming Museum of Art, then we moved around to Shelburne Museum of Art and Echo and BCA and all sorts of different places. And now we have found a home and that's largely thanks to Muscoma Bank. So thank you, Muscoma. Um, we also receive uh, support from the Media Factory um, Media Factory has been videotaping these events from the, uh, pretty much since the very beginning. Solidarity of Unbridled Labor donated, yeah, yeah, who donated their expertise for our branding, our design, our promotion. Um, so pretty much what, what you're experiencing tonight has been really guided by their expertise. Um, and longtime media sponsor, Seven Days. Thank you, Seven Days. Okay, so lastly, I wanna recognize our hardworking team. So like I said, we're just volunteers. We just get together, we meet about once a month. Um, there's, I don't know how many of them, about eight of us or so that come together and try and put on these events four times a year. Um, and so uh, if you see anybody wearing this shirt, the 640, um, they're one of the volunteers. Um, they put in a lot of time and effort, but they're also here tonight to answer any questions. So if you're interested in maybe presenting or getting more information about presenting or just having your uh, questions answered, uh, approach anybody with one of these shirts on. Okay, so Pecha Kucha tonight. Like I say, our third event here at Flynn Space. I wanna give a quick shout out to the Flynn Space staff. They're awesome. Thank you. Pecha Kucha is an international phenomenon now. It's in 1,200 cities around the globe. Uh, just in uh, December alone, I think there were something like 150 different uh, Pecha Kucha evenings. Um, so uh, it's something that's growing, uh, and we've been, like I, like I mentioned, a part of it for eight years now. Tonight's program is a little bit unique in that we thought since uh, it's the new year, and the new year is 2020, that we would kind of look ahead with a little vision 2020 um, at what's coming in the new year 
And um, what we hope is 2020 vision and some clarity. Our theme tonight is optimism. <laughs> and we define optimism as hopefulness and confidence about the future. So, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of a loose theme. Things are not, you know, going to be strictly adhered to, but it's just something that kind of guided us this evening as we put together the program. So speaking of the program, our presenters. Yeah. So who are our presenters? They're your friends, they're your neighbors, your family, maybe a new acquaintance you've yet to make. Um, because of a schedule here tonight at Highlight, we had to condense a little bit. We normally have about 10 presenters. Tonight we had to have about eight. And we lost, unfortunately, a presenter due to uh, unforeseen circumstance at the last minute. So we have seven presenters tonight. And the way that it works is that we have four, and then we'll have an intermission where you can get some beer uh, or, or water or whatever. Um, and uh, after that, we'll have three more presenters. So um, you guys ready to get started? Okay. okay, so our first presenter for the evening is Bethany Andrews Nichols. Uh, Bethany is a graphic pattern designer who, after a trip to India, took a deep dive into the world of developing pattern through block printing. The title of her presentation this evening is Create, Print, Repeat. Bethany? Great, thanks for doing that. I was afraid I was gonna adjust it, it was gonna pop. <laughs> Way to start a presentation. Hi, I am Bethany. Um, I'm ready to go. Um, so I wanna talk about pattern um, and not the technical aspect of pattern because I couldn't really maybe tell you all of the technical aspects of pattern, but to me it is like um, a lifestyle. And I feel like I'm getting like weepy already. Um, not just because I'm nervous, but because I like really truly love it. Like it's um, graphic design, it's pattern design, it's block printing, it's murals, it's taking pictures of tiles, it's going to India and learning about this art that um, they're hand carved blocks, hand printed, I mean, beautiful, like. Each print is unique, even though each print is the same as a graphic. As you start printing it, you notice that each piece becomes its own, it has its own charm because a little bit of the ink is missing or whatever. So I come back from India in 2017 and a month later I got laid off. <laughs> and it was like, yes! <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, this has been my whole life, like, waiting here. And then I created Bonanza. And my logo is a bee being caught by a lasso, and the bee represents, like, the idea, the fleeting idea that you're catching. Um, so here I am. I create Bonanza. I don't know really what I'm doing because I'm actually a designer. So I keep designing. I keep designing patterns. I'm the universe. I I met a guy. Well, I'm through a friend. I met someone in India who said, "Send me. What do you want to do? What do you want to print? What do you want to make?" And I was like, "Oh my God! <laughs> what is this?" Like pinching myself. So I sent art. I just started creating patterns and designing and designing and designing. And this was a this is awesome. My husband actually does drone photography and this was in Iceland and my one of my kids and I like threw it up. But it's cool to see a pattern that can be so small. It's like a six by six inch piece of wood and then as you add to it and you repeat it, it becomes so much bigger than itself. It's really, it is really inspiring and I like still get giddy when I do it. Like I start printing and I'm like, oh, I don't have time. I don't, you know? So <laughs> speaking of like going, I'm like, okay, so print pattern, I love it. I'm, I don't paint murals, but I had 
Thanksgiving break and I had gray paint. So I, I painted our bedroom wall and then Chad walked in the kitchen and was wearing that shirt and I'm like, holy shit. It's the same thickness. I'm like, go stand in front of the wall, I'm taking your picture. Um, so then I was like, okay, maybe I can do murals. And a friend at Foam asked me if I wanted to be part of their Time Kills Art show last March. And this is kind of how, I like to think that block printing is sort of like a meld between craft and art and design. It's like, and this was my art take on it. It was like, all right, you can't use a wood block to print on the wall, so what are you gonna do? So I went to Lowe's and I was like touching all the surfaces. <laughs> and all the people at Lowe's were like, <laughs> what is, I'm like, don't mind me, I'm just rubbing the carpets. Um, but I found this material that I could cut and mount and print, and it was like squishy enough that it would adhere to the wall, so now I'm like, oh, I like created giant block printing. like. And so that, that is also, I have been, I like can't stop. I'm like, does anybody want a block printed mural? <laughs> Please. So I worked with foam and I did a line of block printed beers. And they were like, would you ever come and do like a how to here? And I was like, well, maybe, maybe we can do a workshop. Um, so last May, I held a workshop at foam, which was a total blast. Um, the reason I love workshops is because like here I have these blocks that I've created with a certain pattern in mind and I bring them and people create something totally different. Like that's why pattern is so phenomenal and block printing specifically because you can have a super simple triangle or like these I did today with like a half circle and you give it to someone who has a different idea and it becomes something totally different, totally new. It's actually, it's really inspiring. Like sometimes it's hard as an artist to be like, all right, I'm really into this thing and I'm gonna share it with 45 people. But afterwards I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy I did because I learned something. Like they learned something, but I learned something. Okay, I'm off, I'm off, off course. So I started doing, yes, I started printing vintage clothes, which I loved the idea of because it's like something secondhand, something you're repurposing. Um, and I started, I did the maker skirts for Art Hop, which is fabulous, the Tova Oleander. Um, and this was my newest print that I did, which I call Paper Dolls um, in honor of my grandma because I started, so I started as a design, a graphic design. Here it is, super simple. The, f the face shape is the same and I'm gonna layer on top a different unique hair, shirt. Like th and that is like totally infinite. I mean, I feel like I could keep creating and creating those women forever. I'm like, I, have, I, I, I do not plan to stop anytime soon. <laughs> there is like, an infinite amount of reinventing and recreating that can happen and will happen. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bethany. Our next presenter is Scott A. Campbell. Scott is a mixed media artist who focuses on two-dimensional works on paper. And the title of his presentation is Word Origins, Useful and Creative Work. Scott. Yeah, hello, cool. Hello. Well, if you start the, hello. I'm a visual artist working with drawing and mixed media. I'd like to share some ideas about the creative process by looking at a few words and their origins. Language is how we communicate with one another. Words tell their own stories and many of them directly relate to creativity. Play comes from the old English word plegan, whose meanings include move rapidly, exercise, or frolic. 
Its root is the Proto-West Germanic plegoyenen, meaning occupy oneself about. Also the origin of the modern German word phlegen, meaning to take care of or cultivate. We tend to think of play as involving a toy, an instrument, or a game. The goal can be to gain something or just keep busy. In a creative act, the results vary, but the process is very similar to play. It's an act of investigation, a dance with causality, often having exciting outcomes. Through play, an inkling is hatched into, and grown into a result, sometimes gaining in complexity as it evolves. The sense of the modern German Phlegen is an intimate part of that creative process, to take care of or cultivate. It's a joyful thing, but it's rarely without challenges. In about the 14th century, challenge came to mean something one can be accused of, a fault or blemish, and has roots in Old French, where the meaning was slander or opposition. A challenge can be the exciting part of a process, and it can also make a process super annoying. But a process without challenges is probably sleeping. Anyone who's attempted to, make, to take care of even the simplest thing can encounter the slanderousness of inadequacy. Call it a constraint some kind of stuff in the way of it being easy. It can be time, missing puzzle pieces, or maybe just the wrong tools to use. Even if one sees the path towards the desirable outcome, the process of getting there hides its own mischief. There are always variables, I mean, even if you expect a surprise or two, not all of them are pleasant. If that's not enough, you can even challenge yourself. Process offers discovery, but it also makes demands. As of the 11th century, failure means to be unsuccessful in accomplishing a purpose. It came by way of the old French where its sense included disappoint, but more crucially from the Latin fayer, to trip or cause to fall. Challenges can build and make it hard to move, let alone preserve our balance. Entirely devoid of triumph, failure is one of the most reliable parts of human existence. It's an integral part of the creative process. We may know where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish, but we know we can't see everything on the way there. Most of us simply aren't clairvoyant. Learning to do anything requires us to accept failure as a kind of teacher's assistant. The Latin meaning, to trip or cause to fall, is key here. Falling is the basis of how we ever learn to walk. With our balance at risk, putting one leg in front of the other, and catching ourselves before we hit the ground. Enthusiasm comes from the 16th century Middle French enthousiasme, whose meaning hasn't changed much since the Greek, the Greek one, divine inspiration. It was derived from Greek entheos, made from the two words en, or in, and theos, God, literally, God within, possessed by something. Regardless of how we met the challenges before, the results aren't always desirable. It's the chance to get the right results that makes us persevere. Some embark with enthusiasm and expect something remarkable. Many know it as simply showing up for work. It takes a strong dose of conviction to work towards something, knowing that there will be a wide range of obstacles. One has to believe in something in an unfaltering way, to walk the creative walk, despite compelling evidence of its difficulty, or evidence that it's of little use to anyone else. And sometimes it really isn't. In the 16th century, disaster was understood as anything that befalls of ruinous or distressing nature. It came to us by way of the Middle French désastre, whose Italian ancestor is a fusion of dis, or ill, and the Greek astron, or star, literally ill-starred. Disaster involves a bit more drama than just getting your stars crossed, but the sense of the word is still astrological a star or planet in the wrong place. In stronger terms, it's a sudden and surprising defect in cosmology. It's no less vital than failure, but it makes the process stop abruptly and calls everything into question. Whatever the ambitions may be, a process can reach an impasse. It can be a time to throw in the towel and acquiesce. It can also be an invitation to accept the impasse as redefining. Disaster breaks it all down. It creates new raw materials for new raw ideas. But as we all know, it can be pretty dramatic, devastating even. Courage came to us in the 12th century from modern French, meaning heart and the seat of emotions. 
Its root, the Latin core, means heart. And the rage part, well, let's just say that if you're a human being at all, you're probably well acquainted with it. Courage is quite literally the rage of the heart. The mind is powerful in creativity. It builds sense from what it encounters and finds ways to communicate that out of thin air. It's the master of order and arbiter of entropy. The heart, in the other hand, is what keeps the mind diligent when problems arise, when things really do seem impossible. Our minds are naturally curious, but the gravity of the concrete world we share can flatten them into complacency. Courage is a way to reach escape velocity and actively learn. Without it, the mind is limited to what's knowable and derivative, making little room for discovery. Courage turns characters into archetypes. There are always challenges in cultivating a creative process. When we can't adapt, things fail. Enthusiasm can help transcend those failures. Disasters, while heavy, are a chance to improve our methods. We can't begin to draw without the courage to put pen to paper and continue by beginning again. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I love learning that, that courage is the rage of the heart. Isn't that great? Um, our next presenter is Ray Carter. Ray describes herself as a light in the dark, a woman transformed by cancer, and a voice for heart-centered social change that honors the cycle of nature with compassion and empathy for all living beings. The title of her presentation is Healing with Spider Magic. Ray? When I was diagnosed with breast cancer in January 2018, at age 41, I was already sick. My web had been unraveling for a few years, and deep down, I knew the cancer diagnosis was the catalyst for change I had been energetically calling in. My health crisis was public because we needed support, and publicly asking for help for months was humiliating. I felt alone ashamed and judged. The expectations were overwhelming and the fear was wrecking even more havoc in my body than the cancer itself. My journey was isolating and sharing with others helped me feel connected to people. It made what I was going through real, which helped me to find acceptance for what was happening to my life and body. My intuition was rising and I began to weave together a healing path of mind, body, and spirit. Two surgeries failed to remove all of the cancer in my breast, yet left me immobile with a pinched nerve, forcing me to stop everything. The irony of being in crisis and watching the magnificence of spring helped me learn how to ground into the present moment. I made a commitment to reconnect with plant medicine as I cried into the earth, she held me, and I listened to messages of how our bodies thirst for living in balance with the cycles of nature. As I nurtured the plants, they began to nurture me. I softened into the divine feminine, reclaiming my sensitive, watery, and emotional qualities, qualities that had previously been wrapped up like prey as I strive to succeed in dominant society. The imbalance of masculine and feminine energy in my body was one of the causes of disease. I came face to face with my shadow self and I sank into the darkness to frightening depths. But then I found the light of compassion for all of the people who are in pain and suffering while also trying to navigate our broken healthcare system. Uncovering the root causes of disease in my body became a field of study Deepening my relationship with the earth became magic making in the forest. My legs and brain were happy and my spirit was alive. I slowly began to understand the practice of gratitude. 
there was so much trapped energy, tension, and trauma stuck in different parts of my body from multiple sources over the course of a lifetime. How do I begin to let go when I'm holding on to so much? By creating the space for healing, I felt safe to finally release. I began to make decisions based on how I want to feel instead of other people's expectations. I made intentions instead of goals without attaching to the outcome. I learned how to actually feel my emotions and move them through my body. Pain, sadness, fear, and joy. I learned how to physically let go. I began to notice what hurts by stopping to feel and care for the sensation. I started to understand and honor my boundaries and I let go of many relationships with forgiveness and acceptance over time. When I was healthy enough in mind and body to go back for a third surgery, the removal of my right breast, I was able to find acceptance with myself, who I was, who I really am, and my femininity as a woman with a uniboob. After receiving, after recovering from the mastectomy, I returned to the woods to learn to trust my light and how I am meant to shine in the world moving forward by speaking my truth, reclaiming my power, and creating my own path to live from the heart. My career before cancer was telling other people's stories, which detached me from my own creativity, which I now understand as a spiritual cause of cancer in my body. I have entirely new perspectives about what is important in our changing world and am weaving my knowledge and vision together to encourage more healing in society. I began to sing again, a gift that was buried beneath threads of who I should be and what I should be doing. My words became lyrics and during some of the darkest moments, my partner and I turned pain into music about the darkness and about the light. My unicorn of a partner, Mitch, suffered with me, and the experience woke him to begin to heal from his own trauma. Together, we navigate spirituality, sensuality, the balance of feminine and masculine energies, and the co-creation of healing magic and plant medicine. I share a vision with many healers, culture change leaders, and wise women that healing ourselves is the start to transforming our culture to one of love, hope, dignity, and respect for us all with integrity and reciprocity to the air, soil, and water that give us life. My journey to heal from cancer and several interconnected diseases was not about facing death. It is about being truthful about my life. From here, I raise my vibration. I act with compassion, I speak with love, and I share what I have learned. I practice spider magic. Spiders represent creativity, feminine energy, and the words that weave webs of connectivity and destiny. Spiders have always been around me and I used to get bit because I was not listening. Now I am open to receive the gifts of the spider and I share those gifts with my voice. Creativity can be with language. Power can be with words. Webs can be woven to encourage speaking from the heart and healing from the spirit. In the dark spaces, there are shimmering webs and lights of empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray, for sharing your journey with us. Our next presenter, Jin Ferrara. Jin considers herself a multimediator, a person who helps folks use media to tell their own stories and connect to their communities. The title of her presentation is The Hopefulness of Saying Goodbye. Right, hit it, Drew. Hi, everyone. 
Happy New Year's Eve. <laughs> Woo! This is kind of the perfect thing. I, I got to admit, I don't love New Year's Eve. I've always thought it's sort of sad because you're saying goodbye to this year you know and looking into this kind of God knows what is coming abyss. Um, but I've got a lot of practice now of saying goodbye. And uh, hopefully what I'm talking about tonight is going to kind of get us really excited about the idea. Back in 2017, I really wanted to say hello to something new. I'd had enough of bad news, nasty online interactions, and just the dark, dark days of winter. And I wanted to create something that would make me feel better and maybe make other people feel better. And I work in the Media Factory, which is this amazing community media space in the South End. And we have this community radio station that's literally two doors down from my office. And they were having this call for new shows to be on 99.3 WBTVLP Burlington. And I thought, I was a DJ in college. This is going to be awesome. That is totally what I'm going to do. And so I started this new show. And while I wanted to play a lot of music, because music's super inspiring to me. I also wanted to talk to people who were sort of figuring something out. You know, maybe it wasn't like they were doing the biggest thing ever, but they were working hard and they were finding like silver linings or upsides to stuff. And so the show's called The Upside. And I wanted to get away from the short conversations. So I had these like really long 45 minute conversations with people. And then we had this theme that would wrap around it. And then I'd have this music that fit the theme. And then, of course, I didn't stop there because I'm a graphic designer. So then I had these like graphics for every single show. And then I had this marketing campaign, you know, like putting the news out about it. And then we had podcasts about it and uh, pre-recorded. Like the shows were like online so people would hear it. And it just became this like gigantic thing. And it was amazing. And sometimes really weird stuff would happen. Like I had these amazing young people from the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps come in and a microphone fell while they were talking. And one of the kids just caught it and kept talking. And it was like this just all these sort of kismet moments where you just didn't know what was going to happen. But what happened was really, really good. And we learned like so much from each other. I hope, well, I hope people learned something from me. I learned a lot from everyone who came in. And I'm pretty psyched to see there's actually a few people who were on my show who were here tonight. It was great. And it really did what I wanted it to do. It made me feel good every Wednesday morning to come in at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I couldn't miss it, right? It's a live show. So I kind of couldn't talk myself out of doing it. But I also couldn't stop doing it. And at some point, I started to get a little behind. And one day, the show would end, and I'd be like, oh, who's my interview for next week? Did I email them? Is it working? And even though these were like these amazing experiences I was having, I was talking to people who were knitting in public and writing books and making films and learning how to graduate in new ways, I was also kind of starting to feel like it was a machine and it was no longer just this amazing passion project. And so I had to kind of take a breath and figure out what can I do differently. And I actually looked around and was so fortunate. There was an amazing radio maker at the 99.3 already, Grace File, who was doing her own show. And we'd already met, and we'd had this like, just nice connection. And I said, Grace, would you be my co-host? And she said, yeah. And so now there were two of us doing the show, and it was awesome. So we planned this fantastic fall season to the show for 2019. But as we're planning it, Grace says, you know, I should let you know I am planning to move in the spring. And I was like, well, what do I do here? You know, like, I'm not just going to, like, make a new team up. I'm not going to just, like, look for another person. Do I try to keep this thing going or, or what? And together we decided, you know what? No, we're going we're gonna to stop at the end of the year. We're going to make a great 11-episode season, and then we're going to call it quits. And it was perfect. We were able to relax and do this and just have this great season. All right, all right. You know how cool it is to tell people you're a DJ? It is easily the coolest thing I've ever been in my whole life, like ever. So it's really hard to give that up. But I told someone, the first time I said it out loud to somebody, I was like, you know, I'm going to quit doing the show. And I just felt like, yeah, yeah, that's the right thing to do. It just felt right. 
it also like two hours later I was like what am I doing I'm not gonna do a show anymore but I realized Jen that's just that's just grief it's okay to be sad it's okay to have that you have to kind of go through that whole process when you say goodbye you have to let the end end and you have to have that space because if you don't let something end nothing else can begin you can't just stack one life on top of another life it's too much and so we had this beautiful show and we decided our very last show would be, our last live show was in December. Tomorrow morning, January 1st, 2020, 9 a.m. on 99.3 FM is the final show of The Upside. It's a year in review. I get a little weepy. It's very sweet. And we're done. We're out. And, and then we're celebrating. I've told everybody it's over. And I'm not going, oh, it's really sad. I'm ending my show. I'm like, I'm ending my show. This tonight this is like the best party ever for ending a show like how did this even work out like this so I'm like yeah guys we're all doing this together ending the show and I've got pictures and I've got podcasts and I've got this whole record of all this and the other thing that we still have is all these relationships I see people here I know who are on my show I will see you again we know something about each other all this stuff happened it's okay that it's over it's great and now if I can just be brave enough I can wait and not say hello to something new and maybe hibernate a little and take it in before I take on the next thing. And I can tell you all very clearly, thank you and goodbye. So our first presenter for the second half Diane Gare, after many years of working as an architect doing rural community planning and teaching ecological design, Diane is currently running the art and the environment focused Green Terra Art Gallery in North Hero. The title of her presentation is Of Earth and Being, Photos of Our Global World. Diane? This is a collection of images and words based on a book I created out of photographs I took and writings I made about Earth and our sense of being. It is an observation about the beauty we see in the world and our ongoing habits of building and destroying and our search for light. I start with the formation of geology, that which grounds us in time and space the dynamic conditions of place that surround us and provide the fulcrum for all we know. It is within this realm that we've built the volume of our world. We are storytellers from the very beginning. We see it in our carving out of niches in the tufa rock for shelter, creating zones of habitation by adding orchards for food and terraces for irrigation. We learned to paint on limestone walls. We wrote stories etched out on redstone walls. We carved arches. We molded clay into bricks. And we built temples all across the temperate world. As we build temples, we also tear them down. We build on the site of old ones. We tear down stones deface the gods, rework the ideas, yet meanwhile also reusing the columns and renaming the gods. Our bridge building days rise and fall with technology and innovation. We learn to connect communities across short and long spans, even as we discard the detritus, detritus into the watery abyss below. Whether limestone full of fossils, coral stone taken from the sea, or concrete made up of the same, lime and sand, our skill at corbeling shows off our ancient desire and search for beauty. 
from the past constructions to the present ones, we keep looking for meaning in what we do, in what we build, in what we make, and ultimately in what we hold dear. But I ask, how softly do we walk across the ground? Can we still feel the sacred rock under our feet as we move, work, play, pray? Do we know that earth and what earth feels like? And what stories do we tell ourselves? How do we relate the cause and effect of our actions to one another? What is the story we want to tell, to write on our cave walls? Our agriculture is being undermined by gas pipelines, fracking, stolen water rights, and a litany of more. Where has the idea of food production gone in a field invaded by energy demands? Our wetlands are being destroyed by broken policies, by unseen hands, by voices riding, rising out of a corporate and industrial complex that needs any and all groundwork to feed its greedy, disembodied belly. We are learning to take up arms to protect what we call our natural resources, our own wildernesses, the wild spaces, the remnant places, the animal habitats, the, commo the, sorry, the commons that belongs to all of us. Yet we take solitude in our sacred places, our hidden forest of magical being, our quiet zones of meditation, even as we know that the extremes of weather and ice can destroy what we know. The typhoons, the hurricanes, the flooding don't stop at the edge, don't stop at our national borders or constructed walls. They engulf our gardens, our houses, our roads and schools, from seaside to mountaintop, whether in Vermont or elsewhere. The fisheries and coral reefs, once a lifeline, are crashing under our own weight. The azure blue rumbles with drifting storm, sea, sand, sky, and breathless light. The massive glaciers are melting as we watch. We walk along their edges. We measure their depths. We wait for the next calving. As we dream, we float. We are transfixed by the phenomenal power. The dancing of city lights ensnare us with dreams and draws us close. We are but stardust, motes floating in a world of time. The gathering around communal campfires under the canopy of darkness, we are still telling stories of loved ones gone by of friends and family, of a cherished dog, of all the lonely nights and the glorious days still to come. And at dawn, the eternal, brilliant, returning light that is our sun meets us in our ongoing journey through the mystery that is our cosmos. Thank you, Diane. Our next presenter, Eli Atticus Jagger, is a professional graphic designer and brand strategist working for Trace, a blockchain-based soil-to-shelf tracking application for the hemp industry. He's also an amateur film photographer and writer. The title of his presentation is Making Pictures to Not Look At.
right. I can't believe this is happening. Uh, take my hat off and let's uh, send it, I guess. That's me with my favorite camera, uh, Leica M3. It's a late model from 1957. I've had it for like six months, which is not very long, and I'm not very good at it. But despite that sort of amateurish photography skill that I'm still sort of working on, that guy, my dad, sitting right there, uh, decided you all would benefit from hearing me talk about my sort of photography stuff. Uh, <laughs> So you will suffer with him for the next six minutes. Um, so when I thought about giving this presentation, what I would talk about in regards to my relationship with photography, which again, very new, new thing, uh, I thought of this guy, this guy, uh, Will Homer, who's a very good friend of mine I've known since high school. And in high school, we'd go on these long walks, and he would sort of say, you know, this is nice, because in high school, you're very dramatic and sad, and everything's terrible and he would sort of want to smell the roses a little bit. And I always really appreciated that about him. He would just say, like, this is nice. You know, it's a little walk, but it's nice, and it's important to stop and sort of point out that something is nice, otherwise you'll just be walking, and you won't notice that it's nice unless you point it out. And so this summer I was sitting with a friend of mine by, uh, by a river, and I just thought, like, this is, this is really nice. Like, I, you know, I've, it's been, not that challenging, but it's, been, it's a nice summer, you know, and I want to say that. I don't know this person that well, and I want to more than say it. I kind of want to, like, take a picture. I want something to m remember it by, but taking out my phone and taking a picture feels, like, kind of lame, you know, um, and not, it's not like calling it out. It's a, so I guess what I'm getting at is, to me, taking a photograph is more about the decision to be there with a camera and to sort of call out the moment as this elegant place in time. And uh, so when I take pictures, I don't really think about looking at the picture, which is ironic, admittedly, since we're all here looking at the photographs. Um, but I don't really think about that. I think about just being there. And so when I thought about what camera I wanted to get, I didn't get some fancy digital camera. I got some fancy film camera. Um, and I got a Hasselblad 500C, which was my first camera. It's the same camera that went to the moon on Apollo 11, actually. Uh, not that one. I got a different <laughs> one. And uh, it's a camera that is very difficult to use. It has no light meter. Uh, you have to set everything manually. 120 film is really big and finicky. And you only get 12 shots. And they're like, you know, two bucks a shot if you pay for development and color film. And um, so it's this really serious thing when you take this camera as a big case, I take it out, and I'm like, all right, I'm taking your picture now. Don't move, it's $2, you know, just <laughs> hold on. And so for a long time, I would carry this camera around. It weighs like six pounds, and I would have it around just in, in case. You know, just carrying around this camera alone is like the admission that something amazing might happen, like something worth taking this camera out and like setting it up for five minutes might occur. Like that last shot was at uh, Bread and Puppet with my new fiance. What up, Abby? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so when I first started doing photography this summer, again, new thing, why am I telling you about it? Um, I would take pictures sort of from a distance and from behind. I would notice these amazing things happening and I would decide like, oh, I really want to say this is nice. I want to tell the person it's really nice. So I took pictures sort of from a distance for a long time. And as I was getting more and more into it and wanting to shoot more and more, uh, I somehow convinced the people I work with that, like, you know, guys, our marketing would really benefit from film photographs. So you should buy me some film and let me <laughs> photograph a bunch of hemp growers. And they said yes. It was amazing. And so I had the opportunity to go to a bunch of incredible hemp farmers. And there, there was no opportunity to sort of like, I'm just going to hang back and like take some pictures. And like, if something amazing happens, like, I'll take a picture. Uh, it was like, all right, I'm here to take your portrait for a website where lots of people are going to look at it. So I was forced to like get up and sort of make these moments happen. Um, and I found that really interesting. And this is one of my favorite photographs that I took at a friend's farm as we were, you know, hanging up of that year's hemp harvest. And so that sort of transition from noticing moments that you're appreciating to trying to like make moments, I found a really interesting shift in my life this year. Um, this guy is a one-armed farmer from, 
I don't know what it's actually called. He calls it the lame side of the road farm in the Northeast Kingdom. It's on the same road as the Museum of Everyday Life, which you should all go to. And every year I pick up stuff from his farm stand and I, he was there. And I had met his grandson. His grandson's like biking around at this pit bull all summer. And so I went and took their picture and that's something I wouldn't have done if I wasn't, didn't have this camera in my car and decide like, I'm gonna go make a moment worth appreciating or I'm gonna go find this moment worth appreciating. And this is another photograph that's fairly meaningful. Um, everyone know Maglianero Cafe? Yeah, what's up? This was uh, two of the baristas there on the last day that it was open. And sort of by being there, they're both photographers, film photographers, no less, as well. And uh, being there with this camera and sort of deciding to take photographs of it really changed the atmosphere from this sort of, well, maybe it was a happy atmosphere and the camera had nothing to do with it, but to me it seemed like the camera sort of elevated it into this like appreciative moment. And this is a person I went to school with named Robert, and on my way to work every day, I would, or every Wednesday, he would be walking to baby yoga, which like, so cute. And uh, <laughs> we ended up getting back together, becoming friends again, as I took his portrait every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> Something, again, I wouldn't have done. He thought it was totally ridiculous, which, you know, it is. And so the moments that are really sort of fleeting and precious are one thing, and then there's moments that just happen all the time, and you're reminded to appreciate those for being kind of commonplace, whether you're hanging out with an old friend or your new fiance. Um, and I think choosing to appreciate those moments is great, and for me, film photography has allowed me to appreciate them more, and whatever that is for you, you know, bring it into 2020 and donate to Bernie Sanders. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Eli. Our uh, final presenter for the evening, I know, bummer, already down to the last presenter, but um, uh, is uh, Laura Celine. Did I say that right, Laura? Yeah? Okay. Um, Laura is a yoga instructor and lunar enthusiast trying to slow down in her fast-paced world. And the title of her presentation is Connecting the Lunar Cycle to Foster Personal Growth. Laura? This is it, last one. Good. So just an opportunity to pause between the end of the year, 2019, and next year. This kind of space between where we can reflect on the past and look forward to what's ahead. Um, and to really connect to that universal energy that we ha what happens when we just stop, listen, and feel. And then boom, real life. Hopefully not tomorrow because we should all just be hanging out and sleeping and whatever. Um, but busyness of reality sets in. We have a very action-oriented, fast-paced life. Um, sometimes we're under pressure to succeed, to go and produce. Sometimes we feel compelled to de develop goals, which is great. Um, we might find ourselves optimistic at first, like, yeah, go for it. Um, and as time progresses, Life can throw us on a new journey that might dampen our attitude. So why? Why do we feel obliged to hold ourselves to the standard? We have to work with the push and pull of life. It's more about the journey rather than the end product. So connecting to this idea of dualism, the yin and the yang, the balance of opposites, yet complementary forces, that solar, lunar, masculine, feminine, light, dark, and explains harmony of all things in nature around us. We have the sun or the yang energy that guides our life, our days, and our seasons. It makes life on earth possible. And it's that first spark of energy that we feel at the new year, that desire for action, that feeling of strength and creation. And then there's the yin energy, that lunar energy at nighttime, not tonight, 
But when we come home, when we decompress, when we rest, when we move towards stillness and introspection. And that we have a little bit too little of right now at this point in our life. So these energies, again, are complementary. You can't have one without the other. You have to rest in order to be active. You have to be in darkness in order to find light. You have to fail in order to succeed. There's this fluidity. And then there's the moon, our closest celestial neighbor. It connects us both to our outer world, to the expanse of the universe, and it acts as a mirror to help us look within. And although it's very small, it has a really big impact on Earth. It causes ocean tides. It affects reproductive cycles of a lot of sea species. And maybe, maybe it has an impact on us, who are roughly 65% made of water. Um, the gravitational pull of the moon stabilizes Earth on its axis and slows its rotation. Pause. When we allow ourselves to, let's see, there we go. Um, in our solar world, the moon gives us an opportunity to indulge in self-love. And it's not an indulgence. It's just a matter of taking care of yourself. Because our human experience is riddled with ups and downs, with joy and grief, with comfort and fear, with success and failure. It's important that we acknowledge those emotions, thoughts, and experiences as they are without judgment or shame. And connecting to our yin energy, that lunar flow, helps us to recognize where we're at in our own cycle of life, to tap into our own rhythms and patterns, and to be open to correlations and growth and learning opportunities. Lunar cycle is 28 days. It's a natural timekeeper. It consists of eight phases of the moon, starting with a new moon, growing towards full moon, and then dissipating back to the new moon in order to make space again for the next cycle. Um, each phase of the moon emanates at different kind of wavelengths. Here, which we kind of are at right now, our crescent, um, our waxing crescent, we first start with that empty blank slate and then have an opportunity to brainstorm and to bring about ideas to gather resources as our intention evolves. And then we have our full moon energy roughly two weeks into the cycle, which brings about manifestation or progress towards goals or intentions. Acknowledge setbacks and revise and readjust. And then it's also an opportunity to move forward, to slow or release any intention. And the waning moon is an opportunity to regroup after the apex or big energy. Um, to accept your reality and just accept how your intention is taking shape. The balsamic moon is an opportunity to review and reflect, a time to retreat, to rest, and release attachment from out outcomes, and to make space for the cycle to happen again. As we transition into the new year, let's ease into it. Be sensible about resolutions. Because as we know, life ebbs and flows. Tap into your own yin, yang, balance. And work towards being more than doing. Thank you. My name is Laura. I teach yoga at Sangha Studio, nonprofit donation-based yoga. Um, have a great New Year's. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, thank you, Laura, and, and thanks to all of our presenters. Uh, we had a great lineup. Let's hear a round of applause for these seven picks. By the way, if you want to see these 
presentations again, or if uh, there was a presentation that really resounded with you that you thought, oh, I got to share this with somebody. These presentations are being filmed by RETN, part of the Media Factory. Uh, you can go to the RETN website, and actually there's a, a place there where you can uh, watch all of the local Burlington uh, Pecha Kucha presentations, not just tonight, but from previous editions as well. There's also the uh, Pecha Kucha International website where you can see web uh, presentations from all over the world. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And if that's not enough Pecha Kucha for you, there's an app. Um, and uh, the Pecha Kucha of the day. So uh, yeah, you, see, you, see, you didn't realize there was that much Pecha Kucha in the world, but there is. Um, quickly thanking our sponsors, Muscoma Bank, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. Media Factory, Solidarity of Unbridled Labor, and Seven Days. Yes. And uh, speaking of New Year's resolutions, why not make one to share your passion? Uh, and here uh, on the stage, because that's the wonderful thing about Pecha Kucha. It's a totally welcoming environment. I think if you talk to any of the presenters tonight, they'll tell you how uh, warm and inviting the audience is and how receptive they are. And so uh, it's a really wonderful experience, and everybody's got a passion. Uh, it's, it's hiding there somewhere. Please think about sharing it. And if not yourself, uh, um, if you know of anybody, uh, let them know about the, the website. There's cards on the way out. Um, uh, Heather has one, she's holding up right there, that have the, uh, the link where you can sign up to be a presenter. Um, uh, lastly, uh, if you have any questions, you can see these folks with the 640. And I just want to say just real quick that I, just, I love these guys. They've been so awesome to work with. It's just a tremendous group of people who volunteer their time. Um, and uh, they come together every month uh, and, and recruit and put this on, and it's just a, a tremendous group of individuals that I have the pleasure of working with. So thank you to those guys. <laughs> and follow us on social media, and then very lastly, I just want to thank you for coming out and being a part of this because uh, the most important part of Pecha Kucha is the people coming to listen to these passions being shared. So thank you so much. Happy New Year. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bye.